G'day, and welcome to the AHDC podcast series, Health Design on the Go. I'm your host, David Cummins, and today we're speaking to Simon Kustenmarker, who is the co-founder and director at the Demographics Group. Simon spends his time researching demographic and societal trends in Australia and around the world. With a Master's of Philosophy and a Bachelor of Arts, it's initially hard to see why and how Simon ended up in this career and the connection between demographics. That's why I'm so excited to interview Simon today and hear more about Demographics Group and the healthcare industry. Welcome, Simon. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks for having me. That's a very interesting combination of philosophy and arts. How does one come into a world of demographics where you analyze not only what's happening in Australia, but the world, but how does one get into that based on a master's of philosophy? I'm a geographer by training. So I started my career as a data analyst, stock standard, a job that they take people with any background. And it took me a while until I stumbled across a little outfit called KPMG Demographics back at the day, in the day. And it blew me away just realizing that you could do just the fun bits of geography, meaning demographics for a living. It didn't really occur to me that you could do this. And so that's how I stumbled into demographics. And that has been many moons ago now. And I really enjoy anything about population data, major movements, and how demographics reshape societies and systems, meaning healthcare systems, meaning pension systems across the world, and how we can deal with those very, very predictable changes in our social makeup. So the demographic group, correct me if I'm wrong, would look at historical data in certain regions, but also help predict the future. So you're pretty much almost an economist, but a historian type thing. Is that correct? Exactly. And very much so. Lots of historical reading is definitely part of the job, just social history, but also just looking at long term historical data and then really utilizing the power of demographics in order to foresee the major trends in Australia. And quite frankly, forecasting demographics in Australia is easier than it is in most other places because we have a really clear understanding of how many babies are born every year. We have a really clear understanding of how many people die every year. And we as a nation dictate how we grow our country based on migration. We set targets. We tend to reach those targets. So forecasting our population and our age structure in, let's say, a decade's time is reasonably precise of an exercise in Australia. So demographics, in a sense, is the closest thing we have to a crystal ball when analyzing the future. Yeah, and even those examples there of births, deaths, marriages, life, it's such a strong connection towards health. What historically has been the demographics of health in Australia? Has it been everyone just goes to the hospital and has a baby and then grows old and then goes to retirement living? Obviously, health has changed dramatically over the last few years where health needs have changed, people's desires and treatment has changed. So where does that demographic data fit into the world of health? Well, the first observation here is that we live longer and that we overall are healthier. That's part of the general demographic transition in poor, underdeveloped countries, people die of childhood diseases first. But Australia has long conquered all those childhood diseases, and that means we now have people dying of cancers. And that is, in the demographic world, first and foremost, a good sign, because it means we left all those horrors of early childhood deaths behind, we left war-related deaths behind, and we're now dealing with the ailments of an aging population. So that is, generally speaking, a good thing. But now we need to change or improve health outcomes in these issues. And it means that we live longer lives overall. And then, thankfully, in Australia, about 30 or really it started 40 years ago, politicians were smart enough and forward looking enough. I can't believe I'm praising politicians here to introduce the superannuation scheme, which is exactly the right scheme that you want to put into place when you understand that your population will be aging. Because essentially, you put a gun to everybody's head and you say, put 10% of your income into this bucket. You're not allowed to touch it before you're retired. And most people will have saved enough through the superannuation scheme to pay for their own retirement. That is not a given. You want to remember that my country of origin, Germany, for example, just has one bucket. Everybody 
once again, gun to the head, has to put a bit of money into the major bucket. But once a country like Germany ages quite rapidly, and the aging of society is much, much stronger in Germany than it is in Australia, because it's not a migration nation, then you will reach a point where a smart treasurer will need to ask the pensioners to not have pensions increased, to maybe even decrease pensions that are being paid out. And what will this lead to? It will definitely lead to political unrest. It will lead to charlatans entering the political scheme that just promise uh, unrealistic pension payouts. And Ultimately, this will lead to a radicalization of the political scene in a country, and Australia avoided that. Yeah. Future problems are avoided. So that's a wonderful scheme to give us at least a fighting chance to deal with the aging of the population. Yeah, I think the change in France at the moment it has caused quite a bit of uproar. It's a recipe for disaster if you do not ensure that people know their incomes in retirement. That's difficult. So we're doing this. There's a beautiful thing in Australia that we nailed this uh, down. But if we look at how we manage old age from a healthcare perspective, from a servicing the older population perspective, we have a couple of big challenges ahead. And I'm always obsessed with the population aged 85 plus. Statistically speaking, 85 is a wonderfully clear year because half of the population will have died before that. It's the median age of death. That's literally the definition. Half of us will reach 85 the other half won't. Those who will reach 85 and beyond, half of them at any given point in time, statistically speaking, will require care. That means assistance with activities of daily life. We all know that it is expensive to grow old as a nation. But it is also freakishly labor intensive because you need aged care workers, you need more and more medical staff to look after this. At the moment, right now, we have 555,000 Australians in the 85 plus bucket. And if you remember last year around, we had all those stories of the aged care sector losing workers left, right and center. And then the existing or the remaining workers are being worked to death in order to fill all those staff shortages. And then they become more likely to leave and just things spiral out of control. We risk <laughs> at the moment to look at these kind of issues as the good old days very soon because we are doubling the 85 plus cohort in Australia in only 12 years. By 2035, we'll have well over a million Aussies 85 plus. They at the moment are in their 70s and so on and something like this and they just think that magically enough workers and adequate health care will eventuate. That is far from a given. We need to restructure workforces. We need to become heaps more efficient in the delivery of healthcare and care services to an older population. And we also need to completely change and redesign homes, for example, and whole cities to make it less labor intensive to grow old. What I mean by this, the ultimate goal of Australians is to stay independent, stay living independent in their own home for as long as humanly possible. Australians will tell you stuff like, I want to be carried out of my own home. They're not downsizers at scale, not at all. They want to die in their home, but that means we need to make sure that you can live independent in your house for as long as possible. That means major overhauls, means make bathrooms accessible, widen doors, make them wheelchair accessible, flat surfaces, and so on and so forth. That means that one of the biggest industry, boom industries over the coming decade for sure will be ambulant care and nursing services. Any kind of service that delivers something to a person's home will be in high demand, but we also see major healthcare and mental health catastrophes as well on the horizon, because what happens to old people, currently retirees, still young, agile, can move around and are happy once they are the remaining widow in the house traditionally and they live in a car-dependent suburb. They don't go out much and a loneliness epidemic is among us. And we can already point to those people right now. If you're 65, husband is still alive, that the husband will die in 15 years, you will die in 20 years. Five years of loneliness and old age is all but programmed in. So we could avoid all of those issues by building more walkable suburbs with lots and lots of care facilities close by with medical services in walkable, not drivable distances. This would go a long way in softening problems that we know 
will come. Demographics dictate this. There's no wiggle room to get those numbers wrong. We know exactly the aging of the population because we're only taking people under the age of 40 as migrants. So once we look at the 40-year-old population in Australia, they're not leaving, they're not going anywhere, they're growing old, and they want to grow old wherever they live currently. So very, very predictable challenges that reach us here. So how much of a impact did COVID have on that skill shortage, on that care providing? At the moment, enough hospitals do not have nurses, aged care do not have nurses, cafes do not have workers. So there's already seems to be, certainly in Australia, if not the world, a skill shortage for such care. And we're about to double that demand. And I'm pretty sure we're not going to get the skill demand doubling. So what's the solution? How do we combat that resource versus needs? Well, let's first quickly think through why the skill shortage occurred. So in Australia, we really got used to growing our population base by a net 200,000 people just through migration alone. On, on average, we add 100,000 people through natural increase, more births and deaths, and 200,000 or thereabouts via migration. In the first year of the pandemic, Instead of adding 200,000 people to overseas, we lost 90,000 people to overseas because we made it very clear early on that uh, no financial assistance was going to be extended to temporary visa holders, skilled migrants, and international students. So they left. Almost all of those um, 300,000 people, 200,000 minus 90,000 people, this lack of 290,000 people that just the first year of the pandemic alone created, most of them were employed. So we took those people out. That was the direct COVID impact. On top of this, as if this wasn't bad enough, we have three demographic trends making the skills shortage worse anyways. We would have had a skills squeeze without the pandemic, and now we had a massive skill shortage because you have this big baby boomer cohort retiring on one end of the labor market. The small cohort that is coming into the labor market, on the other hand, Gen Z is smaller than the baby boomers. So we're missing out workers there. As if this wasn't bad enough, you have the biggest, fattest generation in Australia, by a long shot, the millennial generation, born in the 80s and 90s. Just as the pandemic started, they reached the family formation stage of the life cycle. That means they slowly add babies. And even though millennial women return to the workforce at record rates, and after a very short period of time, you just have such a large number of the workers temporarily leaving the workforce. And millennials only got started. So there's another 12, 13 years worth of millennial women leaving the workforce temporarily that takes them out of the workforce. And they tend to be very skilled workers on average because they're highly educated as a generation. So that all combines into a very, very difficult labor situation. But should we actually worry about this now that the borders are open again? Can't we just forever onwards migrate our way out of any existing labor shortage? Theoretically, we might, but it's not just as easy as saying Australia is open. We welcome migrants. Come on over. One issue that we have with migration is that our visa system is slow. So we're not really fast enough at processing them. That's one issue. Another issue is that we do not have our migration policies and our housing policies linked. At the moment, as everyone knows, we have an absolute ludicrous, horrendous housing market, very, very unaffordable housing market. So what is the motivation for, let's say, relatively low-skilled migrants to come here? They want to have an affordable lifestyle offering in Australia. There's no point uh, to come here if you can't afford a decent lifestyle based on your low-income job. And if we look at the healthcare system, of course, we're missing doctors, we're missing midwives, we're missing uh, reasonably paid professionals, but we're also massively missing care professionals and lower-skilled medical professionals. Um, and we need to make sure that those people have affordable housing close by. And those policies, housing and migration, that is, aren't linked to each other. It's almost like they're independently created. That's not smart. So these policies need to go in lockstep because otherwise the only way that a sizable aged care provider can find staff is that they become a housing developer or housing owner, that they become a landlord, that they buy or probably build housing. 
I would be advising any major healthcare organization to build any major development without building huge staff accommodation next to it. You need to become the landlord of those dwellings in commutable distance. They don't need to be on-premise. They can be close by. But if you think that the free market will provide housing for your low income, low paid workforce, I think again, it won't. So just on that, is that a model that's overseas? I've started to see that in Australia now. I was thinking one in Sydney in particular. Is that something, a model overseas? Because that's a phenomenal innovation there that you've just talked about. It's an innovation. It's an absolute brutal shift of thinking because as a big business, you cannot rely on the free market to provide housing, particularly for the low income jobs that are out there. And if you provide housing, you will get the workers because not everybody is doing this. So the advantage that you have is absolutely massive. There is, of course, a big tradition of providing housing. Just think back to Industrial Revolution England, the titans of industry approach. If you built a big fat factory back in the day and you were hoping to have enough workers looking after your garments or boating things together in your factory buildings, you needed to provide a little village almost next to the factory. And we're going back to these days because the free market isn't equipped to do so. Um, that, of course, still assumes that you get the labor in the first place to develop buildings. But that said, all the big folks will always prefer a big development over fiddling around with a bit of infill development here or there. So I think you should get the big builders interested in projects like this. And usually you should be able to convince your accountants to hand over enough money for these kind of projects because property in Australia tends to look really good on a balance sheet. So your accountants will probably give you the thumbs up for an issue like this. So this is part of the skill shortage. You can counter this by providing enough housing. Of course, it also means that as a society, we need to improve the pipeline. One absolutely crucial step that we're making big progress towards universal free TAFE education. There must be no hurdles whatsoever into TAFE degrees. It's okay to charge people for university level training, particularly higher medical training, because ultimately you earn enough money to make up for this handsomely. But TAFE jobs don't tend to pay it that nicely. So don't put any additional hurdles in there. Always make them universally free. No exceptions whatsoever. Push people into the right degrees. Uh, and all the major health players want to have a very, very close relationship to those TAFE institutions so that they get the pipeline of workers that they need. And you then need to provide the whole package, also meaning looking into housing to make sure that those young, low-skilled workers get retained in your organization and in your region. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult to staff your organizations in the future. I don't think you took a breath in the last 20 minutes, but that is a phenomenal amount of information. And my mind is spinning with opportunities because as you just said, that's the past, this is the future. It's going to happen. So what are we doing about it? And I think as designers and, and developers and in the construction industry for the world of health, we all have an amazing opportunity to really make sure that this trajectory of crash in seven to 10 years time, we actually have the opportunity now to fix that, especially knowing that the aging population is going to double in the next seven to 10 years. So I think that's a phenomenal amount of advice and information and a great roadmap for so many people. Thank you so much for your time, Simon. I think your brain is obviously very, very powerful. That's obviously where you get the philosophy. That was the answer to my first question, philosophy. <laughs> but that's the outcome, isn't it? A powerful brain that can predict the future. Everyone will find something very, very powerful and, and positive from this chat because what you've really done is highlight what's going to happen in the next seven to 10 years. So thank you so much for your time and all your effort that you put into demographics with your company, Demographics Group, and actually your passion. It comes through very strongly. Been a pleasure. Anytime. You have been listening to the Australian Health Design Council podcast, Health Design on the Go. If you'd like to learn more about the AHDC, please connect with us on our website or LinkedIn. Thank you for listening.